All right, hey guys. So this is um, the next video in our little series. This is the video that corresponds to the autonomic nervous system chapter for your course back. And again, this video is coming to you via the Scrubs team, which is the student collaborative resources for understanding and ready success. So going through the mission statement for Scrubs, Briefly, um, Scrubs is a student-driven initiative that aims to develop supplemental resources for current and future cohorts that will pass through Brody. And the idea is that members of Scrubs will participate on a variety of subcommittees that will work to create these resources for students by students. And with this in mind, this will offer the unique perspective from a student that has walked through the same shoes, developing resources that we wish we had, had when we were in the course. So the, the hope is this organization will become a staple of the Brody student body. And if this is something that you may be interested in in the future, we invite you to join the team after you have completed your course. So with that in mind, a quick disclaimer, um, as these resources are made by students and faculty, there is a possibility for errors, although we do try to mitigate this by going through multiple stages of vetting. Um, if there is a contradiction in the coursework presented at any point, please go by your course documents. And again, um, Scrubs is a supplemental resource, so it is not meant to replace the instruction of the Brody faculty. And with that in mind, please use these resources as a supplement, but not as a primary source for course material. Okay, with all of that out of the way, we're going to go ahead and get into the actual um, material. So we're looking at the autonomic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system is going to be split into two divisions, the parasympathetic parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. And we'll cover both of those more in depth as we go forward. Now this slide looks really busy, but I just want to point out some key overviews before we get into the details of the uh, more specifics of the autonomic nervous system. The first thing that I want to point out, up here, these first two nerves are representing parts of the um, somatic nervous system. So this is your voluntary control. And what you can see here is you have nerves that have origins in the spinal cord and they go all the way to their target. So there is no synapse until they get to their target organ. In the autonomic nervous system, this is going to be slightly different. In order to go from the central nervous system to your target organ, you are going to have to synapse along the way. So what this means is that there are two nerves in the pathway to get to your target organ in the autonomic nervous system. Okay, so the nerve that you see before the synapse, and here's the synapse here, the nerve before the synapse is called the preganglionic neuron, and the nerve after the synapse is called the postganglionic neuron. The reason that they are called pre- and postganglionic is the synapse point is going to happen at a ganglion. And remember, a ganglion from oh, the previous video, a ganglion is a group of cell bodies that are located outside of the central nervous system, which in this case is a spinal cord. So a group of cell bodies located outside of the central nervous system is termed a ganglion. So you have a pre-ganglionic neuron and a post-ganglionic neuron, and the synapse point is going to be at the autonomic ganglion. Now, this image over here on the right, I just wanted to represent some of the targets for your autonomic nervous system. Again, your autonomic nervous system is controlling your involuntary um, motions and movements. So this is going to be like your heartbeat, your lungs, your breathing, your digestive tract, um, a lot of the things having to do with erection and um, some urination and things of that nature. You're also going to have your blood pressure regulation and a lot of the pressure in your eyes um, from your the fluids that are retained behind the eyes is going to be happening by the autonomic nervous system control. But that just gives you a brief overview of some of the targets that you'd be thinking about when you're thinking about the autonomic nervous system. Now, last thing I want to point out is remember um, from the last video that GVE and GVA, general visceral efferent, in general visceral afferent. The V here is going to let you know that we're talking about the autonomic nervous system. So one more time, general visceral efferent, E meaning going away from the central nervous system, general visceral afferent, so going towards the central nervous system. Now getting into some more of the um, nitty-gritty details, we're going to start with the sympathetic nervous system. And your sympathetic nervous system is commonly thought of as your flight or flight fight or flight <laughs> system. So what this is going to do when activated is going to accelerate the heart rate, raise your blood pressure, and it's going to pull blood in your vital organs. So think to yourself, what would I want to have happen if I was running from a bear? If pretty much everything that's gonna happen is going to be due to the sympathetic nervous system activation. Now in the sympathetic nervous system, again, we already mentioned for the autonomic nervous system that you have two ganglion, or sorry, two neurons that have to um, 
transmit until you reach your target organ. In the sympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic fibers are short. So one more time, the preganglionic fibers in the sympathetic nervous system are short. The postganglionic fibers are going to be long. Okay, so preganglionic are short, postganglionic are long. But this is specifically for the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, there is an exception to this, which is the splanchnic nerves, which we'll discuss a little bit later in this video. Now, in terms of the neurotransmitter that is used for each one of these um, fibers, the preganglionic fibers are going to use acetylcholine. Preganglionic fibers in the sympathetic nervous system use acetylcholine. Postganglionic fibers are going to use norepinephrine. Preganglionic is acetylcholine. Postganglionic is norepinephrine. The only exception to this is that the postganglionic fibers to the sweat glands and the erector pili, this is what gives you your goosebumps, are going to be using acetylcholine. So outside of this one exception, preganglionic fibers are going to use acetylcholine. Postganglionic fibers are going to use norepinephrine specifically for the sympathetic nervous system. All right, so continuing on with our sympathetic nervous system, where are the cell bodies located for your preganglionic neurons? And that is going to be in the regions of T1 through L2 in the intermediolateral cell column. So let's look at our spinal cord cross section here. Your intermediolateral cell column is kind of over here in between the anterior horn and posterior horn. So right in this region, that's your intermediolateral cell column. And you are going to have the cell bodies for your sympathetic nervous system located at the regions of T1 through L2. Only at these regions. You do not have sympathetic um, cell bodies located anywhere else other than T1 through L2. So this means that no sympathetic GVE fibers are exiting the spinal cord outside of these levels. Okay, so the only time that you will have sympathetic GVE fibers exiting the spinal cord is going to be at the levels of T1 through L2. Now, a brief pathway before we go into it in a little bit more depth. The pathway for the um, GVE fibers is going to be arising in the intermediate lateral cell column. You are going to leave the spinal cord through the ventral root. Okay, so through the ventral root, you are joining the posterior root to form a spinal nerve. Once you form the spinal nerve, you will continue through the anterior ramus and then you are going to go through the white rami communicons to hit the sympathetic trunk. So we'll talk about sympathetic trunk on a future slide, but again, the quick overview of the pathway for your preganglionic fibers is going to be anterior medial lateral cell column, going through the ventral root, joins with the posterior root to form a spinal, spinal nerve, goes from the spinal nerve to the sympathetic trunk via the white rami communicons. And it's called the white rami communicons because this preganglionic fiber is going to be myelinated and this that myelin looks white. So white rami communicons helping me to know that this is a myelinated nerve fiber. Now, I mentioned the sympathetic trunk very sympathetic trunk very briefly, but here we're going to dive into it a little bit more. The sympathetic trunk exists on either side of your spinal cord. So either side of your spine. Okay? And this is it looks kind of like little beads that are tied together with a string. Now, the sympathetic trunk runs all the way from C1 up at the top of your neck down to the pelvis. But we mentioned that we only had sympathetic fibers leaving the spinal cord from T1 through L2. So we're only going to get input into the sympathetic trunk from those levels. So one more time, the input to the sympathetic trunk only comes from T1 through L2 via the white Remy communicons. But we do have the sympathetic trunk extending from the C1 region north, near the neck to the pelvis. That is going to allow sympathetics to be distributed throughout the body, even though they're only arising from T1 through L2. Now, we have, again, white Remy communicons is what allows fibers to go from your spinal cord into the sympathetic trunk. So following the mouse here, from the ventral root, spinal cord, white Remy communicons to sympathetic trunk. As these are only coming from T1 to L2, you will not have white Remy communicons at the cervical or pelvic levels, just the gray Remy, which we are going to go over in just a moment. So looking at the uh, fiber pathway options, there are a couple of things that the preganglionic fibers may do. They are always going to start from the intermediate lateral cell column, come through the ventral um, horn, or sorry, come through the ventral root, 
form a spinal nerve, and then go into the sympathetic trunk via the white Remy communicons. That is consistent no matter what. But once they've hit this sympathetic trunk, there are a couple of things that can happen. Now, the sympathetic trunk, all of these bumps that you're seeing, these are ganglion. So this is the, there is the possibility of a synapse at every single one of these ganglion. So the first thing that can happen is that the preganglionic fiber can go through the white rim communicons and synapse at the ganglion at the same level. So that would be this green fiber here coming through, goes through the white rim communicons, and it synapses here. So it synapses with another neuron. That neuron would then be called a postganglionic neuron. That is option one. Option two is that you can run through the sympathetic trunk superiorly or inferiorly without synapsing until you get to another spinal level. So let's follow this green fiber here. It's going through the ventral um, root, spinal, cord, spinal nerve, coming through the white Remy communicons, and instead of synapsing, it's running superiorly. So it runs up and it's going to synapse in a, at another spinal level before it exits the spinal cord. Okay, so that is option number two. And the way that I think about this is we said that we had the sympathetic trunk going all the way up to the cervical region, but there's no input from the um, sympathetic nervous system from that region because remember those neurons, those preganglionic neurons are only arising from T1 down to the level of L2. So in order to get sympathetic fibers up to the cervical region, a fiber has to run through the white Remy communicons and up through the sympathetic trunk before it synapses at the level that it's going to terminate. So another thing I should point out is whenever you synapse in one of these ganglion, you're going to leave the sympathetic trunk at the same level that you synapsed. Okay, so you're only traveling up and down if you have not yet synapsed. And the third option, the third option is that you can travel through the ganglion without synapsing. Okay, and then you're going to go straight out um, via the splanchic nerves. So that's going to be this blue fiber here is what it looks like. So we're coming through the sympathetic trunk, or sorry, we're coming through the uh, ventral root, spinal cord, we go into the ganglion, but instead of synapsing, we're going to pass through the ganglion through this route without synapsing. So I'm still preganglionic. Okay, so I would follow this and you can see it's cut off here, but that would then go to an effector organ. In this case, the one above it is going to the heart. And this is going to be preganglionic steel because you have not synapsed. Okay. Now, if you are taking option number one or option number two, I said that you can synapse within the ganglion. Once you synapse within the ganglion, you have to go back towards the spinal cord, or sorry, the spinal nerve. So you entered the sympathetic trunk via the white Remy communicons because that is myelinated to get, once you synapse, to get back to the spinal nerve via the postganglionic nerve, you are going to go through the gray Ramy communicons. Okay, so gray Ramy communicons right here. So you synapse in the ganglion, go through the gray Ramy communicons, and then you're going to go back through the spinal nerve to distribute to wherever you need to go. So these are your three options that can occur for the sympathetic nervous system for those preganglionic fibers. And again, one more time, if you do not synapse within the ganglion and you exit you are a splanchic nerve, and that means that you are still preganglionic. Now, splanchic nerves will synapse in a ganglion because, again, the sympathetic nervous system and all, or the entire autonomic nervous system is a two-fiber pathway, so you do have to synapse in a ganglion before you get to the target, but it is going to take longer to get there. So, therefore, they are going to have long preganglionic fibers because they do not synapse in the sympathetic trunk. Now, one, two other points I want to make. All postganglionic fibers are going to be unmyelinated. That is why when we're leaving the um, sympathetic trunk and going back into the spinal nerve, we are going through the gray Remy communicons. Gray because it is unmyelinated, so it looks gray um, when we look at it and on the cadavers. And then sensory fibers are going to accompany these nerves. The way that the sensory fibers are going to accompany these nerves, they're going to follow the same distribution except they're coming from the periphery and going towards the central nervous system. And instead of going through the ventral root, they are going to go through the dorsal root. And remember, you have that dorsal root ganglion, where, which is where the cell bodies are going to be located for those sensory fibers. So sensory fibers, GVA fibers, are going to go through the dorsal root into the um, posterior horn.
Now, moving on to parasympathetics, your parasympathetic is your rest and digest. So rest and digest means slowing your heart rate, you're increasing peristalsis, which is the movement of food through your gut, and then you're opening your sphincters. Okay, so allowing all of your digestion to happen without running from the tiger. Now, parasympathetic fibers do not distribute to the limbs. Sympathetic fibers will distribute to the entire body, but parasympathetic fibers are located only in the trunk and in the head and a little bit in the pelvis, but they do not go to your arms and legs. Unlike with the sympathetic system, you are going to have long preganglionic fibers and short postganglionic fibers. So this is flipped from the sympathetic system. So this is one of the key points that you need to take away from this between parasympathetics and sympathetics. Parasympathetics have long preganglionic fibers and short postganglionic fibers. Also, unlike the sympathetic nervous system, both the preganglionic and postganglionic fibers are going to use acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. So preganglionic and postganglionic fibers are going to use acetylcholine. Now getting into a little bit more of your parasympathetic nervous system, some really big points that you want to keep in mind for the remainder of the course. You only have pri uh, your preganglionic cell bodies located in specific regions of your central nervous system for your parasympathetic component. The parasympathetic nervous system is going to have preganglionic cell bodies associated with cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10. This will come up again later in the course, but for now you just need to have drilled into your mind that cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, and 10 have parasympathetic components. And we can see that in this diagram up above. And you see, as we're going through the spinal cord, we have a big gap. There is no other parasympathetic um, cell bodies that are located throughout the remainder of the spinal cord until you get down into the sacral region, specifically S2 through 4. So S2 through 4 are the only spinal cord regions in which you will have parasympathetic preganglionic cell bodies. Now, these nerves, are when they exit the pelvis, are going to be called pelvic splanchic nerves. These are not the same thing as the splanchic nerves of the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, the sympathetic nervous system um, terms the splanchic nerves based off the region that they come out of. So if it was at the level of L2, it would be a lumbar splanchic nerve. If it was at the level of T2, it would be a thoracic splanchic nerve. If it was down in the sacral region, it would be a sacral splanchic nerve. But specifically, pelvic splanchic nerves are referring to the parasympathetic components, and they are not associated with a white or gray Rami communicans because they do not go through the sympathetic trunk. That is because these are parasympathetic fibers and not sympathetic fibers. Just like in the sympathetic system, you are going to have sensory GVA fibers accompanying these nerves, and the, their pathway is just going to be the reverse of the GVE fibers. So GVE, you're originating from the spinal cord or the cranial nerves, you go towards your target organ. And one of the things this diagram does well is it represents those long preganglionic fibers with really short postganglionic fibers. A lot of times these postganglionic fibers, the synapse, is actually going to be pretty close to the organ, maybe even in the walls. So keep that in mind, the difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems is the difference in fiber length. Right, that's one of the main differences. So in the parasympathetic system, you have a very long preganglionic fiber, very short postganglionic fiber. Now getting into the clinical uh, correlation for this specific chapter, there's only really one that you need to know, and that is Raynaud's phenomenon. So Raynaud's phenomenon, or Raynaud's disease, is going to be an instance in which in the periphery, especially in the hands and the toes, you have vasoconstriction of your vasculature. So your arteries normally are open. They allow blood flow to come through. With that blood flow, you have heat, right? Because it's coming from the center of your body, which is nice and warm. But in the cold, your sympathetic nervous system says, holy crap, it's like I'm running from a bear. I need to take that important vascular and I need to, I need to make it go to my vital organs. So I'm not worried about my fingers or toes. I'm worried about my heart and my lungs. So what happens is you vasoconstrict, meaning you close down those vessels and there's less blood flow coming down to your extremities. So with that less blood flow, they can get very, very cold. Okay, so what's happening in Raynaud's phenomenon is you have vasoconstriction of your extremities and that is going to decrease the heat that those extremities are gonna get. So that means that you're kind of pretty much 
causing frostbite. But you're doing that um, even if it's not extremely cold outside just because you are closing down on your arteries. Now, this is, one more time is due to arteriolar constriction. Now, this is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. So, one of the possible treatments for Raynaud's phenomenon is the destruction of preganglionic nerves to inhibit vasoconstriction. These are preganglionic sympathetic nerves. That is one of the possible ways to treat Raynaud's phenomenon is to destroy the preganglionic nerves that go to the vascular supply to inhibit the ability of vasoconstriction. You can see over here on the right, this is a person who has Raynaud's disease. You can see that their fingertips are very white as opposed to the more pink looking color of the, the dorsum of their hand. This is because they have lost the blood flow to their fingertips. And that is because of sympathetic controlled vasoconstriction. So last time, one of the possible treatments for Raynaud's phenomenon is the destruction of preganglionic nerves to inhibit vasoconstriction. And with that, that'll bring a close to this particular video.